How about now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Can everyone hear me somewhere around the world? Yes. Are you sure you want to hear me? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you have to keep it light all the time, all the time. Well, I am uh, really thrilled. I've been missing everybody, everything ever since I left India. Of course, Swami told me my mission was over and to come to America. He gave me Pacific duties to do, which I've been failing miserably in writing this book about my adventures with him and in metaphysics and all the wonderful things he's exposed me to. So having you all come together like this and come into my house is a great honor for me. Listening to the budgets again means everything to me live. And if you're ever doing the budgets again, zoom in to me. I want, I want to participate if I can. Sure. It, it uh, takes me into other realms, which I adore. I know all of you that went to Puta Party and even the many, many times I set up on the, on the diocese around the world, everybody thought I was falling asleep, <laughs> but I wasn't falling asleep. Uh, I was communing with my inner guru, uh, and it's just an extraordinary thing and something that's very easy to do if you, if you believe in it. So I don't want to say too much because I can go on for hours. I'd rather hear some of your questions, and I'll do my very best to answer them about anything in this dimension or others if I can. Any questions? Yeah, Sairam, Sairam, brother. And this is oh, Yogi. Uh, yes, uh, yes. So, yes. As, I, as I promised you earlier, that, uh, I mean, this is something, you know, uh, of course, uh, the work of uh, healthcare, I mean, of course, healthcare, nutrition, uh, education, very dear to Swami. And uh, with the healthcare, you are the first big instrument that he used. Uh, and we really want to know more about those early days or the, the stories that are not out in, you know, that, that we, we haven't seen in the books or things like that. But basically your recollection of uh, uh, the whole Puttaparthi hospital and, and basically the, you know, uh, any, any angle of uh, Swami's love for this work in healthcare, just share that, that would be, you know, we would appreciate it, brother. Sairam. I think Swami's love for humans in every aspect of evolution being healthcare education is quite well known. Uh, the building of the hospital, you probably all know the story. I made a whole bunch of money and I went to Swami and uh, in the beautiful, you know, I, I've been with Swami now almost 50 years. Uh, but I went into that little wonderful uh, interview room and told him I wanted to give this money, uh, but I wanted to give it anonymously. And the reason being is I had a daughter, Augusta, and she's a devotee, and I did not want her to come there and be a marked person. When you become famous or wealthy, you become a marked man. It creates envy, jealousy, false friendships, everything. And I didn't want her to be pointed at after I leave or she goes down. They say, oh, that's that rich guy's daughter. So I said, Swami, I'd really like to give this anonymously if I could. He shook his head. We then went outside and he said, look what Tiger gave me. He gave me this check. Wow, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> Just to show you how he determined he was to get me involved in the whole thing. He then took me in and because I'd built things all over the world and came from Years of lucky to be involved with great business people, including my parents in particular. And he said, I want you to be over the entire hospital, the building of the hospital, the medical planning, uh, and also the construction. I said, Swami, please, uh, you know, these guys you got out here. I mean, I'm the only white boy in this whole group <laughs> and they hate me already. Uh, you, you can't really, uh, they're going to be so angry that you put me in charge. They've been in charge with everything from the beginning, all of them. And they were a tough political bunch. You know what religion's all about. A, big, a lot of it is politics. No doubt about it. It's only human nature. So I said, you can't. They'll, they'll, he said, they'll, they'll try to kill me. They'll do anything to stop me. He said, Tigrit, you run them over. You run them over. I said, I'm quite capable of doing that. You really you run them over. So I did. 
and uh, I ran every one of them over and took control of the whole thing. We had a beautiful off. Uh, it was a beautiful room at the end of the Pune Chandra. And that's where we would meet once a week. Now I was flying back and forth to London. We had the uh, we had the leading hospital group out of Nashville, Tennessee, the biggest in the world, doing all the medical planning. We had, of course, wonderful Larson and Turbo, which, by the way, this is the biggest project they were ever done. They were never anything big. They were small little guys. Swami blessed them, and now they're probably one of the biggest companies in the world. And there are many devotees within that company. It's quite amazing. So we had this meeting on a regular basis, and uh, I had several five people. I said, watch these guys. Swami said, give all of them just little jobs, little jobs so they can't screw up or can't do this or that. So I said, okay, fine. And so I gave Colonel so-and-so and Mr. such-and-such and all the people all around the table little jobs. And I had men watching them constantly. Make, he said, you watch them. You keep pushing them. You keep suppressing them. Don't let them get near the project except for little jobs. Well, I took off to London, and I was working with the architects. We had 100 architects and medical planners working. And I got a call uh, from my people. They said, something horrible has happened. He said, you know, all that steel that we had coming in from the north, uh, like 20 truckloads has disappeared. And, and uh, also, uh, you know, uh, all of this equipment from going through customs and it's been held in customs and uh, this and that. And all these different men were in charge of these different things. And wire, we had two million feet of wire that was supposed to go the whole thing. So I found I went rushing back there and, and they came up to me. So, oh, so sorry, Colonel would say. Uh, the truck steals, we don't know where it went. It was down, coming down here, but it's disappeared. And, uh, and then Major so-and-so in charge of the wire. Well, we, we thought we had the wire bought, but it ended up on the docks in Chennai and somebody's picked it up and it's on the way to Singapore. Oh my God. And then the third one came along and said, oh yeah, all that medical equipment. I mean, this was a famous politician actually, who's supposed to be in charge of it. All that, uh, all that equipment, it's it stuck. It's stuck in, uh, in, in customs, and they say they want all the back data and where it was done and who did it and all the information on the machines. And uh, it's, it's stuck in custom for at least a year. So, when, oh, my God, I flew back from London. I couldn't believe it. And uh, I went into this meeting. First of all, I saw Swami, and I said, Swami, uh, you know, this is happening, this is happening. He said, I'll take care of it. So we went into the meeting in this great room with this huge mahogany table, beautiful. You get 30 people around there. I got my people and all these boys. And I was just about to literally attack these men because I am a warrior and I really am good at it. When all of a sudden Swami came into the room and he came right up to me face to face. He said, you have destroyed my project. You have used my name wrongly. You have my money is missing and stolen. And this is happening. This is, and he took his handkerchief and he threw it into my face like two feet away. The energy coming off of him and that that close. And that I fell back and I fell back through a door in the in the right behind me and out into the yard, started crying, upset. The energy alone that he put through me scared me to death. I thought I was gonna die, burn something. I went running to my room. <coughs> I went and running to my room and, uh, you know, I cried all night long. What have I done? I, I'm going to resign tomorrow. I've, I've obviously done something wrong. I don't know. I state used, misusing his name, stealing his money, uh, ruining the, the, oh my God. Came down to Darshan the next morning, sat there getting ready to, if he called me to tell him I resigned, he came out, Tigret, come in here. I came in, I sat down so terrified he said hey tiger swami only acting just acting he said don't worry i scared all of them in that room you're the only one who have taken that so i let them all see the power he said but you'll have no more trouble with any of those guys for the rest of the project oh my god so i went to the afternoon meeting colonel joe at I'm not going to say his name. Colonel so-and-so stands up and says, we found the steel. It's a miracle. We found it. it was in some village. It went the wrong way. It's on the way here now. Then the, the famous politician got up and said, I, I made a couple of calls. And it looks like we're going to get all of that equipment through customs. No problem whatsoever. And then the guy for the wire from Chennai said, it didn't go on the boat. We found it. And ever since then, the project 
ran as smooth as possible. Now, I don't know if you all have ever seen Swami and his Shiva self, which he is Shiva Shakti. It's pretty frightening, pretty amazing. But to me, that was one of the most interesting parts of building the hospital. The second part was oh, Mr. Ramakrishna, who was the head guy for Larson and Turbo. We were the two of us. We had 2,000 men on that project working day and night, lights at night, mud, horrible. I was, I was surprised nobody got killed, actually, in a job like that. And we were, he, you know, he gave us one year, right? He announced it's going to be in one year. Three months later, I'm still sitting next to his side and he hasn't chosen the architects yet. So by the time we got Critchlow, which he finally told me that's where he is, go get him. We had eight months left to build the whole hospital from the beginning, eight months, 2000 men. We we're working like hell. The prime minister is coming to open the hospital. This is a big deal. Prime Minister Rao, who changed India by opening it up to the West. Big deal. Oh, so Ramakrishna and I were just dying. We'd finished the outside of the building and we painted the whole thing. And we were putting in all new lawns and, and bushes and everything. But on the inside, there was nothing. It was mud. There was mud on the floors, rebar hanging everywhere, no walls, no anything. So Ramakrishna and I said, we're just going to have to go tell him that he's coming in two weeks and it's just a mess. It's not going to happen. We were so upset. We were talking there. And all of a sudden, here comes that old ambassador car. <laughs> Sai Bob in it. He was an ambassador. He comes rolling up. And he said, hello, you know, the, 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 the prime minister's coming in two weeks. Yes, Swami, we know that. Let me show you how the ceremony is going to work. First, we will walk into the dome. We walked into the dome with the mud and everything else. We had a little you know, planks down to walk on. Then we're going to walk to the left and go upstairs, and we're going to look at one, uh, one of the rooms that's been prepared for operations. We're going to show him that. Then we're going to show him the first little section of one of the wards where there were six beds and everything. Put. So, we're, oh my God! So that's all we worked on for the next two weeks. <laughs> and sure enough, when the prime minister came. We were putting marble down on mud two hours before he arrived in the dome itself. We were painting the stairs and getting everything ready. And sure enough, he came and we went into the dome, which looked beautiful. And then he, we went on the stairs, which looked great. And the whole thing was just drops. We put drops down everywhere so we couldn't see anything else. <laughs> but it was pretty fantastic. The only other story I have about that hospital is a selfish one. Actually, it's for everybody. Sai Baba uh, called me from my room. He said, let's go for a ride. I said, okay, we got the car. We go out to the hospital. We go into the dome. This is some months after this happened. And uh, he said, look, there were like seven little sections of the dome coming up. Beautiful. Uh, he said, you know, Ty, Green, what do you think? I'm going to paint uh, Krishna's picture on that section. I said, oh, that's great, Swami, fantastic. Huge, a 30-foot Krishna. And this one over here, I thought I would put Rama. Yes, Swami, yes, Swami. And on this one right here, I'm going to paint a picture of you. I went, oh, God, what are you talking about? You mean a picture of me? No, Swami, please, no, Swami. He said, I said, they're all gods. These are all gods. And he said, so are you. So are you. And that is the message, the only message I can give all of you. <laughs> you're all divine beings and you're immortal. That's a fact. How do we get so confused? What's going on? Why can't we feel the, the true personality which is inside? God said in the Bible, many other texts from many other religions, God created man in his image. It's not a physical image. It's a spiritual image. It's the God is formless. So that formless power of God is put in you. It gives you life. It gives you life. That prana energy is a whole life force. It's a life force also for every animal on the planet, every fish, every bird, every, every single flower, every, everything, every tree, all of it is given life, given life. 
it's just the most amazing, amazing, amazing phenomenon. <laughs> It's so beautiful and so incredible, but we, we don't understand. We don't understand why. Okay, the soul comes down, it enters the fetus, uh, life begins, but all of a sudden we're in the mind-body experience. We're not in a spiritual experience. We're not even aware of the soul within us and the power of God that lies within each and everything he's created. We don't even know. So all of a sudden, you start receiving millions of inputs into the synapses, into your brain from the five senses, touch, taste, smell, hearing, sight, everything. Millions and millions of pieces of data coming in every single 10 minutes, five minutes, one minute. And so we have no choice but to believe we're the mind. We're the mind. My whole body tells me I'm the mind. That's for I'm the mind and the body. Because the five senses are coming from all over me. So we, we just lose the fact that we're divine beings because we're distracted. We're distracted. Right now in Atlanta, in India, in Clarksdale, whatever it is, we're all being distracted. All these things swarming around us, all these things to do with our mind-body experiences, inputs and input, we get distracted from remembering him. A long time ago, when Phyllis and I started working, this great yogi that he sent me to work with for 10 years, and I think I've told some of you, some have heard rumors, I did not know this was going to happen. I met Phyllis five minutes after I entered the ashram in 1974. Five minutes later, we were all in a deep trance going into other dimensions. Wow! And then I met her again, and it happened. I met her again, and he was bringing us along. Suddenly, he brought us together, and this and that. And then finally, after... Wow, 20 years, 1990, he said, Tiger, you leave your family and your children in England. You go to wherever Mrs. Crystal is. She says, she's a great yogi. This is her last life. She has so much power, which I was aware of. He said, you go and you buy a house next door to her. And for the next 10 years, you're going to over, go over to her house every night or a couple of nights a week. And you will do what I've been training you to do, but you'll do it continuously. I want someone to put a, uh, be sure and put a mic on her because she's going to narrate everything we're doing. So we'd sit across from each other and go into a trance state. We would both, our light bodies would leave. It was so incredible. The light body was out here. Suddenly I'm in my light body and she's in her light body. And guess what? There's no mind-body experience, <laughs> not in the light body, so we're free. That's the only way he could really use us, frankly. And he would then hold our hands and say, today we're going here, today we're going this, the past, the future, help these people. It was always helping someone, always, ever. over 1,280 hours I have recorded of these amazing trips. And, you know, you really think that... The here and the hereafter are woven together. Don't be for a second think there's, there's this and then there's some other place. They're all here in the same dimension. All the locus, 12, 13, 14, how many? They're, they're all in the same space we're sharing now, just on a different vibration. Just on the dimensions here. Everything after death is here. Everywhere we go, it's all here right now. It doesn't go anywhere. So it's, a, it's an extraordinary thing to learn. It's a very difficult thing to remember. It's very, very difficult to remember. You know, I feel blessed by listening to these budgets just now because it raised my consciousness. It gave me a sense of remembrance of who and what I was and what I dedicated my life to. I wish it would happen every millisecond of my waking moment, but it doesn't. Swami, I have learned to talk to him. I'm in communication with him all the time. Anytime he taught me how to get in touch with him anytime I want. And I'll talk to him and he'll talk to me and he'll cut jokes and he'll be himself and he'll give me duties and this and that. And then all of a sudden I'll go away for two weeks. I'll forget he's even there. And I'll go back. Oh, Swami, I'm so sorry. You, where have you been? You forgot about me for two weeks. Because we do. We do. The fact that the, you're a great culture, an amazing culture oldest culture in the world, inherently in your spiritual DNA, you all know 
about divinity. You all know about Rishi powers. You all know about yogis. You all know about life after death or the ability to come and go. It's in your culture everywhere. But like all things in all religions, we are unfortunately at the end of a Kali Yuga. The, Kali, the darkest time, the time where we don't have a clue who we really are. We don't have a clue what our true, true personality and identity is. That's why we're born. Every single master in the world. Every single, go to Zarathustra, Lod, Zu, go to all of them. We're born for self-realization. We're here for this much time. And we're given a small window in which we have an opportunity to find out and realize our true personalities, which is divinity and immortality. You can, your soul, your, your true identity, which goes on forever, it can't be soiled, it can't be hurt, it can't be damaged. Nothing can touch it. Nothing. It's the most extraordinary and wonderful experience I've had to be out of my body and not brought down by this heavy, heavy five senses. I'm the mind, I'm the body. This is what's going on. There's nothing else. Oh, I hope there is. People want to believe there's life after death. People want to believe there's other worlds. People want to believe there's angels and other positive beings. They try to believe it in faith. And you must continue. The thing that he gave me is he took me there. He took me to these places. He took me and showed me, I guess, so I could have this meeting today. I don't know. <laughs> he always told me, do these meetings, talk to me. And I said, but Swami, if I talk about these things, nobody will know what I'm talking about. He said, only need to get one. If one of them understands and pursues, that's all that's important. So out there somewhere, there's one of you, I hope, you can understand how gracious and wonderful life is and how precious. Look at the Ukrainians, okay? What an extraordinary, what a bravery, bravery beyond belief. If someone attacked America, do you think we'd be filling up Molotov cocktail bottles and standing in front of cannons and not giving up our beliefs for anything? Those people have stimulated the entire world in the middle of something I call the shaking. One of the things that Sai Baba told Phyllis and I almost on every session when we would leave, he said, I've got to break you to remake you. I've got to break you to remake you. You're born into a certain family, even in the womb. You're catching vibrations and you're being you know, completely channeled into certain feelings and so forth. And then you come out in the house, you're influenced by the family and what they think and what they know. And you start developing your, your character and this and that, or your beliefs or non-beliefs. And then there's your neighborhood and what that is. And then your ethnicity and what, what are my ethnic followers believe in my town, in my country. He has to destroy that to build a new you, to build one who's more receptive. Because all that that you've been given is, is nothing but downloading a lot of nonsense. So it's so amazing. I've got to break you to or make you. He talked many, many, many times about the Kali Yuga coming to an end. About this, because it's so hard to believe, it's only been 20,000 years. <laughs> but it's amazing. The Kali Yuga, he says, is coming to an end, and this new age is at hand. Almost impossible to believe when the mind-body experience is, is defining everything that's going on around and it seems almost impossible. The rougher it gets, the more destruction, the more rebuilding, I've got to break you to remake you. The virus, the virus, there has not been a global event that the whole globe was involved in until 60 million years ago when the asteroid hit the earth. 60 million years ago, the last known thing that affected the entire planet. Now we have this virus. Every single corner of the planet has been shaken, has been broken, has been changed, has been, everything is in flux and everything is, every country, Every country, we're spoiled here in America, no doubt. But look at all the 
horrors that you know from your own relatives and friends and India that they've gone through. I talk to villagers in Puttaparthi every week or so. That's my home. That's my heart. That's where I grew. That's where I learned. That's where my guru kept me. And it's just amazing what they've gone through. This is a shaking. This is Sai Baba's doing. It's the shaking. It's very important to break everything down, to start again. So this is a good thing. Yes, it hurts and people die. But you can't die, right? You can't die. <laughs> you're immortal and you're divine. You can't die. That's all I can tell you. This shaking, this stuff that's going around the world today is God and his greatest beauty. Changing the world, shaking the world, getting ready for Prima Sai. Prima Sai, well, apparently, as Swami has told me personally, and I love it so much, he said, during his lifetime, the consciousness of man will rise to a point where they can see the collective. And not just people who meditate or pray. It's going to happen to everybody like the virus, whether you like it or not. Oh, my God, it's amazing. That's like the days when we first arrived here. Unbelievable. It's so extraordinary. It's such an important time. Such an important time. And you have to embrace it as his. He's doing this. This is his planet. These are his people. This is his, Jesus, cosmos. Cosmos means everything. Everything. It's just the most amazing thing. I can only tell you about my own experience to this level of the collective. Through the grace of Sai Baba, at, at his doing, not my doing, in sessions with my dear Yogini, we were together 10 years we worked every other night of the week. 10 years. I've got stacks of this stuff to the ceiling, <laughs> all these journeys into other realms and to other things. But this is his doing in every single way. It's, it's, it's so exciting to be here right now. So what happens when you get through his grace up to this is a consciousness, a feeling, a sense? I don't know. He's put me in the state of samadhi several times, excuse me, with Phyllis and I, and then made us work for hours. And, and we go, Swami, this is amazing. I'm in a total state of bliss. He said, yes, I want you to be there. But now we're going to work for three hours because I want to show you how I do it, how you can be in bliss and still work and operate really spectacular spectacular so what is this collective raise the consciousness to a new sense of perception and i wouldn't call it completely eyesight and what do you see you're up to a level where you see the collective it's like a spider's web right everything is connected you see it all the trees all the flowers all the birds all the human beings all the animals all the grass, all the flowers, they're all collected. He's in all of them. He stays with whatever he creates. That's what keeps it going. It's its life force. And they're all connected. We're all connected to the, the collective. <laughs> all is one. All is one. So when you get to that level, and you see you're connected to everything. And it's your equal to everything else in his creation, you do not want to do any harm to anyone because you realize that whatever you put out into that net, that collective, that quantum field can do harm. And, and, and when I saw it and felt it and had been there a couple of times, I realized I cannot hurt anyone. I can't, I I'm in fear of hurting anyone because I know what it does to the collective. And supposedly in the time of Prima Sai, we will have a raise of consciousness, like a virus actually. <laughs> we'll have a range of consciousness where everyone will be able to see the collective and to feel and know and know inside the heart, inside the mind, forget it, that we're all connected. All is one, all is one, all is one, all is one. It's such an extraordinary thing how the cosmos even works. Cosmos means everything. The heavens, the universe, the stars, the planets, all the, th every single thing, that's the cosmos. Cosmos means everything, everything. 
What powers it? He showed me. What powers it? This amazing, amazing wheel of birth and death, birth and death, birth and death. Birth is this powerful, amazing, extraordinary explosion onto the planet and you're a reality and then, then growing and so forth and down to the end and then death is this engine of birth and death, birth and death. It's so powerful. The energy is so powerful. It's, it's what feeds the whole cosmos. It's what makes it work. So what in the hell are you scared of? Are you scared of being born? Are you scared of death? I'm a little bit scared of being born again after all I've seen. <laughs> so I have to tell you the one antidote, perhaps, that one of the, I was a hard convert. Sai Baba has been kind enough to appear to me in the flesh on six occasions, starting in 1976. I was in a hotel room, and some, some of you may have heard the story, but it's important to understand what it, what it taught me. Uh, I'm in a hotel room in Denver, Colorado. It's midnight. I'm 24 years old, I guess. And I have an epileptic fit, epilepsy. And I lose my, I lose my motor response. I can't move my arms and legs. I'm foaming at the mouth. I'm hyperventilating. I can't see. It's all blurry. I fall to the floor and I, I can't move and I'm shaking and I fit. And I swallowed my tongue. I swallowed my tongue and I was choking to death and I couldn't even move my hand up to my mouth to pull that. I couldn't move it. I choked to death. I died. And like I always read, the spirit comes out of the crown chakra, came right out of the top of my head. And suddenly I'm up on the ceiling and I'm laughing. <laughs> Literally. I'm in a state of bliss. I know who I am, but I'm formless. I have no body mind experience. I have the experience of the true immortal personality, which each one of you possesses. It was amazing. I was laughing. I couldn't believe it in bliss, knowing who I am, but no longer dragged down by this delusion of Maya. And what happens? <laughs> it's so amazing. I'm looking down at my dead corpse. Wow, what is that? What, what, what is that? I thought it was this. Oh my goodness, what's this? I'm looking at my dead corpse on the floor and I'm up on the ceiling giddy. <laughs> this is so cool, I can't believe it. And Sai Baba comes into the room. He picks my body up, puts it on the bed, presses on my chest. I'm watching from above. All of a sudden, I go back into my body. I'm looking up, and he's smiling at me over the bed, and then he goes. But what I discovered during that death experience, and so lucky to be brought back, perhaps just to tell you, <laughs> you're divine and you're immortal. You can't die. All you can do is be confused. Why am I here? What's going on? What are these feelings? Anger, lust, greed, this dangerous, dangerous being alive. So you have a choice of what emotions you're going to feel. Either you go for the, the five Vedic values in your life, or you can go down to the lower end, which we all fluctuate in, me included, of envy or lust or anger, one of the biggest, anger, hatred. Those are the lower forms. There's a book, I have it here. Uh, where is it? I gave it away. I had copies, I had dozens of them, I gave them all away. It's called uh, the uh, it's by Aldous Huxley. Anyway, in that, he, what's it called? I have to find it. I've given so many copies away. I can't believe I can't think of the name, but I'll think. Aldous Huxley was one of the greatest spiritualists that ever lived. He lived back in the 40s. And he, get, he also was a great writer. He wrote many famous books and this and that. But he was a spiritualist. He gathered all the leading spiritual people of the world together, the mediums, the psychics, the people, the yogis, whatever he could find, they get together and have meetings. And the, he wrote a book. Uh, God, I've got to get that book. Anyway, it's a book about all the religions and all the things that all the master says. And he goes through ancient India. He goes through Persia. He goes through this. He brings all these texts from these masters together. 
And he said, there's one common theme in all of them. He says this in the introduction. Y'all are going to probably think this is pretty naive and pretty silly, but this is the truth. The only way you can raise your consciousness, the only way that you can become a pure person closer to your divinity inside is through compassion for other people. That's the only way to raise the consciousness. Compassion for other people. Love. All of them said the same thing. And he said in his book, you're all going to think I'm naive, but that's how you do it. That's how you raise your consciousness. That's how you find some kind of peace of mind. This is when you come closer to God. Compassion for others. Let me give you an example. People come in this town. There's people on every street corner of all the exits of all the freeways and everything, and they're, they're homeless and they're begging for money and this and that. People pass them right by. And I always give them money. I'll turn around and go back and give them money, but that's not the point. The point is, if you see one and you look over there and you're already in your mind, you know, it's like look, a person walk, comes in in a wheelchair and you're like, oh, you know, hurt, not pure, something's wrong. The same thing with these people. You see them, you turn your head. You don't want to do anything. You don't have to go and give them a dollar like I would do. Just send them love. Just send them love. Go beyond. We all create this walnut shell world for ourselves. My house, my family, my car, my children, my business. And we, we feel all comfy cozy being there. Nothing can shatter us except it's, it's all illusion. You die anyway. It's all temporary. But you feel safe. You have to break out of that shell. Go beyond that. You can do it just with your mind in meditation. You can send love to the whole world. Earlier tonight, just before you came in, I was begging Swami, please. He taught Augusta. I mean, pardon me, Augusta, that's my daughter. <laughs> She's driving me crazy these days. Good friend of Sai Baba from a baby. But it's a, it's an extraordinary thing. This is what. Sai Baba gave to Phyllis and I. He said, this is, this is what, besides that wonderful mantra, he said, you only need one mantra. I'm God, I'm God, I'm God. Let me see the hands of how many of you are saying that every day. Come on, I dare you. I dare you to say it because you can't believe it. How can you, if you don't believe it, how can you say it? This is part of our learning experience. This is part of our journey. This is part of our road. This is such an important opportunity. So he gave Phyllis and I this mantra. Some of you have heard it. He was very insistent upon us. He made us say it over and over again with him. Really amazing to start anything. Lord, think through me because everything starts with a thought, a thought, a plan, an idea an action. Lord, please think through me. But wait a minute. Where is the heart? It can't be just the mind. Lord, feel through me. Bring my heart and mind into perfect balance. That's the only way you can, you can even down, download divinity. Heart and mind have to be equal, balanced, balance, balance, heart and mind, heart and mind, just like Leonardo da Vinci. He was just channeling God. How about that boy and the busker that's down in the subway in London playing perfect, beautiful music on his guitar and his hat is filled with money. Because he was got the mind and body. He, he got it. The heart, heart and mind. So he got it right. That's why he's got plenty of money in this little hat. Lord, think through me. The first, the first of the actions. Lord, feel through me. Feel through me. Temper my thoughts with compassion, love, whatever's necessary. And then the next thing after you've gotten your idea and you've got it feeling right and everything, Lord, please speak through me. Because that's the next thing that happens. You verbalize the thought and, and what you want to do. You start talking. You start doing it. And then the next one, Lord, please act through me. As I go through these actions, of all these things that I'm doing, please act through me. I don't want to act through my brain. You act through my, you come into my brain. You come into my heart. You think through me. You feel through me. 
You act through me. The next, Lord, please love through me. Now you're putting the sugar coating of truth and love and divinity on the whole thing. Lord, think through me. Please think through me. I'm so tired of my own thoughts. Lord, think through me. Feel through me. Bring my heart, heart and mind together. Please speak through me. Please act through me. Please love through me. Please, I beg you, please, please do these things. I'm welcoming you in. And that went on for about a year. And then Swami was teaching Phyllis and I. He said, I'm adding something else to that. Lord, the final, Lord, breathe through me. How many mantras do you say a day? Anybody? 23,000. Because your breath is a mantra. So hum. So hum. 23,000 mantras you speak every day in your body, in your real, forget the mind, in your existence, in your prana energy. It's just spectacular. If we can remember, I am not a good devotee. <laughs> I've learned a lot. He's so kind to me. He's helped me so much. I don't know what I did in a past life to deserve it. Actually, he took me back to some past lives where I murdered millions. <laughs> and he told Phyllis and Phyllis as well. He took us both back. He said, this is your chance Why I'm using you. This is your chance to pay for all the carnage and disruption you caused in past lives. That's why we're here. You know, it's the, the laws of physics and 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 the laws of metaphysics are identical. For every action, there is an equal reaction, law of physics. Same thing with the laws of karma. For every action, there's an equal reaction. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. Okay, it's, it's like, uh, how can I put this? We're surrounded by God's radio for radio waves. <laughs> it's called the quantum field. It's a field of divine energy that's in the entire cosmos. So it is recording everything. I know this sounds simplistic and it may not sound great. It is. Everything is actually so simple. How everything works. How everything works. So very simple. So this quantum field is it's like a it's like a depository. So when you do those actions and the, it goes out on the quantum field, it's just waiting for the right moment to come back. You know, it's it's an extraordinary and simple way things work. But we've got to, there's not much we can do except pray, have compassion for other people. This is the most difficult time mankind globally has ever been. We could have World War III. Who cares? You can't die. Maybe we need to cleanse this planet big time. Let the planet get back its health. Keep a couple of million people around to reprocreate the earth. Let's go back to being the divine beings we were when we first arrived here. And we were divine on the first arrival of creation. So, you know, I, I wish I was in Atlanta. I wish I was in Puttaparthi. I love Puttaparthi so much. I think about it every day. It's my home, my spiritual home. And I love Mutnahali. He brought me there. I, I, I told you or have told this story, but uh, before he went, he told me he was leaving. He said, look, I'm leaving early. There's another section to my mission, and that is to prepare for premisai. So I'm going to leave, and it's going to piss off a lot of people. He didn't say that, but you got the message. People are going to be upset. People are going to be angry. People are going to say, oh, he lied. Oh, he told us he's leaving at 90. No, he's leaving at 81 or whatever the hell it was. You know, they're going to, they're going to oh, I don't believe in him. He lied. Their, their, their depth of their devotion is about that pig. How much attention can I get from him? I'm following whatever. I'll tell you an interesting story. And I have told it before. Uh, when, when we traveled first to England, I think the first time, and there was a lady 
who was very famous in the suburbs. And she had a huge altar where Vibhuti formed all over it. And people would come and sing budgeons and it would appear behind pictures and this and that. So people were coming from all over the world. This lady had people waiting to come in. She was always dressed up, let them take some Vibhuti, let them do this, do that. So we were going into this house. This was before the big Hara war, which was so appropriate, started. <laughs> we're going into the house as we're walking, a little suburban house outside of London. Uh, Swami turns to me, he says, uh, talk about selfless service. Okay. Well, I don't know what to do. I just do what I'm told. And then he puts the thoughts in my head. So we go in and we open the door and lo and behold, there's a, one of those life-size pictures of Swami and behind the glass and written in Vibhuti that was formed behind the glass, service, S-E-R-V-S, all the way down. <laughs> just looked at that. <laughs> I thought, wow, there goes my cue. I sat down. About 10 size centers came. There were two or 300 people there. And this little house had opened to another room with big doors. And that opened to another room with big doors. And that opened to another big doors on the outside. And so the place was packed. I said, Swami wants me to talk about service. I said, the one thing I always love about side devotees, as opposed to me and my Christian back background, I come from 200 years of Baptist ministers and missionaries. I was in church five days a week. It was torture. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> so the one thing I love about the Psy organization, as compared to the Christian one, is, of course, we would in our Chris, okay, we're going to have a, we're going to feed the poor downtown today. How many, it's the same 20%, 10% put up their hands. I said, but at the site organization, everyone is required to do service. It's expected that everyone is required to do service. How many people in this room are doing service? Every hand goes up. Yay. Yay. I said, that's good. Now, how many of you are doing selfless service. We started looking at each other. I said, I said, a lot of you, maybe most of you, are doing this in the side because everybody else is. And you can't be part of the side organization unless you're out giving and doing this and that. And you're doing it because the other ones are doing it. You know, and you're you're scared. You're part of a group. It's a club. It's a religious or whatever. That's not selfless service. I said some of you are doing this because it makes you feel good. It makes you feel really good. It's not selfless service. I said, a lot of you are doing it for the most insidious reasons because you're worried about what other people think. That's not selfless service. Now, let's have a show of hands of how many in this room are doing selfless service. No hands went up, 200 people. It's as if they just discovered what service was all about. That was Swami's message to them. So you have to be, the service that we do in this organization has been extraordinary all over the world. The smallest little group of 10 devotees or even one doing what he can. Most things that are done in this world that are for others, done anonymously by people that will never be seen or known. No one else even knows they're doing it. They're anonymous. They do it from the heart. They do it out of obligation to their brothers and sisters. So the service thing is something you must always guard. You must always guard it into being selfless service. Otherwise, it's a waste of time, total waste of time. Because the service is not necessarily for the other people. The service is for you. You're serving yourselves, your higher nature. Look, I had many, many... Uh, when I opened the Hard Rock, I'd open a soup kitchen in every town. And I would, having worked in <laughs> pretty amazing things, but my kids, because I, I hire 18 to 21 year olds. And so I, I, I insisted, like in New York, we partnered with something called Women in Need. There were 60,000 homeless women and children <laughs> in New York. That's 1984. I insisted that my people go down there and serve on the weekends and whenever they could. And all the kids volunteered and they all did it on their own accord. And I got back and I got them into a big group one day. I said, okay, what do you all think? What, what's the story? What did you learn? 
lady says, uh, I learned uh, that these people in horrid conditions in the soup kitchen that we see, uh, they, they don't want food. They don't need food. They can get food in garbage cans like they always have and always will be. What they want is respect, love, someone to touch them, reach across, give the compassion to a filthy, dirty man whose teeth are knocked out, who's bleeding that one side of his face, who hasn't taken a bath in six months. Just by saying these things, you have given me a boon by inviting me to come and speak to you because as I speak, my consciousness rises for you and the world and everything. You have given me a great boon today. Thanks. Okay, enough of that soliloquy. Any other questions? <laughs> this is RJ in Atlanta. We have uh, quite a few questions and you've already answered a good bit of them uh, because they were about Ukraine, um, some other topics about self-realization, uh, one of them said, teach brother Isaac, I think you just did. Um, <clears throat> and you know, by the way, with your violent history, I'm glad this is a Zoom call, not in person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so one of the questions, a uh, couple of them actually, uh, from, let's see, Catherine Young. Is it true that whatever Swami said would come true? Not necessarily. Look, it's all a game. It's, he's, he's, it's a game. And he's playing with all of us and everything. You know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that something will come true, but it means if he said that, many things do come true, that he wants you to think about it, be involved. One of his favorite things to do, RJ, give faith, take it away. Give faith, take it away. Give faith, take it away. <laughs> That's how he makes you grow. Because if you come back, the faith is strong. And then if something happens and it doesn't make logical sense, you, logical, Sai Baba, you got to be kidding me. Logical? <coughs> when you become a realized being, and there have been thousands, many, many thousands, many, mostly unknown throughout time, when you get CD powers, you get great insights. But the most important thing is you get the Akashic records are available to you. The Akashic records are a mythological library of everything that has ever happened, every millisecond, with every individual, everything, not only in this dimension, but all the dimensions. It's all written there, everything. So they all have their little finger in the library. <laughs> So when Sai Baba sees you, he sees you from all your past lives and the past karma, all your present lives and its karma, and all your future lives. It's a bizarre perspective that only realized beings have. So when he relates to you, he relates to you through this amazing perspective. So he may tell you to do this and it smashes up against the wall. He may tell you to do that. It's all for your own good. If he has to fib to you or encourage you to get to that point, he will. Sai Baba was with me through the Hard Rock Cafe. At the very end of it all, through the selling and everything, I got ripped off for about $400 million. <laughs> and I did the House of Blues at his encouragement. Tigret, we must build something to show the Americans what the... African-American contribution has been to America because nobody knows that all they see is pictures of slaves. So I did it. He, how you doing? Do more, do more, blah, 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 do this. Uh, Swami, we're about to go public. Yes, that's wonderful. He said, you bring in these big partners. What partners? So you can get anyone. I window dressing. We're going public with DLJ, blah, blah, blah. So I get Disney. I bring him in as a partner. I bring Chase Manhattan Bank in as a partner. I bring Harvard University in as a partner. Before that, I said, Swami, if I do this, my interest in my stock is going to go below 51%. Don't worry, I'll take care of everything. At the end of the day, the place was so successful that Chase and Disney got together. So we want to take the whole thing for ourselves. And they threw me out of my business, a boardroom thing. 
then he got me involved. I, I started doing that wonderful years. I worked for five years as a director and trustee and regent at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City, the greatest institutions for, it, it's the home of, well, it was Dean Morton, who was so incredible, of multi-faith. I mean, it, it's just turned into the most amazing thing. I mean, Mother Teresa would be there one day, there'd be Port Laureates, this, they just turned it into this amazing multicultural, multi-faith thing. And I thought, oh my God, this is great because the internet's coming along. And with Dean Morton and with Swami's push, I said, Swami, you know, this opportunity, they say that we'll be able to broadcast on this internet. And we can broadcast films and everything is coming along soon. This is in the 80s. And the internet was just starting. Oh, yes, you must do that. It's very important. Well, for me to go out and raise three or four hundred million dollars, having done this a couple of times before, you have to put a book together. It takes months, if not a year, to put it together. You have to have one of the leading top five firms to say, go out seven years with your P&Ls, profit and loss, and, and, and write, this is correct. Everything, it's a big process. It was costing me $2 million to put the book together, leading marketing people. So I'm going to put the party, and he's always asking, how's the Spirit Channel, Spirit Channel? He loved it. Yes, you must do that. You must do that. How's the Spirit Channel coming? Oh, it's coming along, Swami. I'm just, you know, I've, this thing, I've got, got to do it right. I have to answer every question in this document that any banker would ask me or any accountant or any investors people. So he said, well, how, you know, how much longer? I said, I don't know. I, he said, well, how much money do you need? I said, well, I, I need a million dollars more to finish this. I figure I have to put in a million dollars more. He fine. I'm sitting up on the veranda of this group from Kuala Lumpur going or some bloody place. And they come out and uh, they go, oh, Mr. Taggart, Mr. Taggart here. I said, yes, I'm right here. He said, you come to my room. I went to his room after Darshan. He's sitting there with his check. He said, Sai Baba told me, give you uh, $1 million. And he writes a check for a million dollars and gives it to me. And I said, oh, please, <laughs> please, sir. Uh, let's get my lawyers. We'll, uh, we'll get some documents together. So, no, no, I want you to cash the check so you know that it's true. And the Sai Baba is that. So I cashed the check, and sure enough, a million dollars came into the bank. Not long after that, the internet crashed. This was a big crash where they realized we can't broadcast like we thought it's going to be another 10 years. And we had done a deal to put broadcast cameras in every holy place in the world. Dean Morton had done this through the cathedral. We had it in, in the Blue Mosque. We had it in temples in India. We had it in everywhere, hundreds of them. And so people could come to a religious service anytime they wanted with their faith and their main calls or whatever. And it all destroyed. Then he got me into another project. Encouraged me, pushed me, so forth. I put $2 million into that one. It crashed. Just a weird bunch of circumstances and so forth. I never said anything or complained. I knew that he knew what he was doing. <laughs> 15 years go by where Montesudan, we're at some bloody place, Dubai, I don't know where it is. There's a bunch of people sitting around. He goes, Tiger, big businessman, yeah, big businessman. He said, Swami rose him up and crashed him down. Five times he rose him up and he crashed him down. He rose him up and he crashed him down. Five times. I'm going, you bugger, you did all that to me. But you know, I wouldn't change a thing because what it made me was much more than I would have been if I got that 600 million bucks. It made me everything. He put me in total poverty. You know, it's, it's just extraordinary. I wouldn't change a thing. So be wary of judgmental things on the things he's doing and what's going on. It's so far beyond your understanding. And he may be doing it just to give you a lesson. That's more important to him than anything else. He didn't care about hospitals and schools and all that. He cares about you wanting to build them and, and, and work there and help others and get that higher nature going. This is a grace that people don't have. I mean, can you imagine a living avatar? being in his midst, listening to his words, watching the phenomenon of the whole thing. Oh, my God. The, the Jews don't have that. 
the, 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 all the other religions. I mean, the, the, the Tibetans have the Dalai Lama, but he's not an avatar. So how lucky we have all been. So let's get with the program and understand it's all a teaching game, period. So sorry about all that. <laughs> Next question. By the way, I love laughing. I got to keep it life. I took all this seriously. I'm an idiot. Be happy. Be happy. Be make jokes. Be friendly. Care about others. Bring their livelihood up. You know, it's, well, there uh, is it's another question. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Sorry, I'm talking too much. No. Uh, <laughs> so there's a question from Ananda Mai. Go ahead. Uh, please elaborate on the Mississippi Project progress. And also, thank you and so happy to see you. RJ, you and the people of Atlanta made that thing happen, period. In every way. I asked Swami to do that. I'm from the South. I have many, many relatives in Mississippi and in Tennessee, where I'm from. I have witnessed the horrors. Uh, my town was 75% Black, Jackson, Tennessee, as is Memphis and all many towns in the South. I grew up seeing the horrors and the, the oppression that still goes on. They don't want to ever get them to get ahead on anything. And just this impoverished world that they live in. And I've always, my heart was always going out to them. My God, I did the House of Blues just for Swami to tell others they, they've given great contributions, music and art laughter the best thing you know what swami told me about africans <clears throat> he said they have but by far before any other race they have the ability to love more than any other race he told me that three or four times and i believe it i've been with them their spirituality is so intense that have you ever been in a black church unbelievable you cannot out christian black folks let me tell you right now <laughs> So the point being is, he gracefully said, "Okay, we'll open this." Is it just a? I, I just I want to take it back. He said, "Okay, we'll do a place down in Clarksdale, Mississippi, where I've been many, many times. It's the poorest town and the poorest state. And I'm sure all of you that have gone down there, all you wonderful people from Atlanta, uh, and and tried to make this thing happen. Of course, the pandemic came and all kinds of other problems. But if he said there's going to be another hospital," There will be a bigger one. If he said, if he said, the, but you don't know when, you don't know how, especially the when. I love the, the when question more than anything else, but I don't ask that anymore. I just go, yeah, I'm sure it's true. Uh, yes, sir. Whatever you say, I'm, I'm with you. You tell, and so RJ, seeing the incredible work that you and your crew did in Atlanta to make that thing happen. All I did was go down and put a few decorations up and make a speech or two or something. And unfortunately, uh, COVID came. I was supposed to be teaching at the University of Mississippi, lecturing there. I had a job and I had a house. And then all of a sudden the pandemic came, the school closed down. I had to move to California to be with my daughter, who takes pretty good care of me when she's in the good mood. And <laughs> so I've been, I've been literally here in, in California for the last year and a half, the whole closed down, we couldn't leave and anything like that. I thought I was back in my little room, uh, S3, D8 and 9, by the way, in Puta Party, that was my, that was my address <laughs> for most of my adult life. But that's what happens, you know, and maybe it didn't happen the way everybody wanted it to happen, but you kept fighting it and you kept going down there and you kept getting that doctor from Alabama to fly over once a month and you got the ones from Memphis to come down and maybe do a little and it's all for you. It's all for you. I'm telling you, it's all for you. I mean, just like the building of this, and I'll tell you something very much that I'd like to talk to you about, Luke Holly and, uh, and all of that crew down there, <laughs> quite amazing. So he called me, it was, I'll tell you this little anecdote too. He told me before he died, he said, I'm going, but I, I need you, wait in the ashram. I'll call you when I need you. He died. 
God, what a beautiful funeral. It lasted for three or four days. There were men and women, villagers that were lined up for miles to come and see his body. I only went down at night because all the in crowd that had the little seats next to the to the little tube were fighting over the seats. <laughs> so I would go at night, like midnight, and there would be no one sitting there in the VIP section, only 10 chairs. And I sat there and had the grace to watch these amazing villagers who absolutely had faith and believe those ancient people it's in their dna it's it's everything and to watch their faces and to watch them oh it's just amazing anyway sai baba said okay now we're going to go around we're going to open these hospitals we're going to uh we're going to open a lot of schools i find this the most fascinating at all because this is all in preparation for the third Baba avatar. Everything that's going on, him leaving early, starting this, keeping everyone away, creating a big fight. He loves that. Choosing a few devotees for this interim period till Prima Sai comes. So he's building all these schools. Well, I must tell you, the first time I went up there, no one, there were only three people that knew he had come back. And they finally called me a, a year after Swami died in the ashram. And, and Murti said, oh, the, I knew Murti from before. I used to come there. And he said, uh, Sai Baba wants to see you. He's in this building on the top of this hill in this obscure school that nobody knew about, which he's built all this stuff before he left. He, he started building all that before he even left. He just go in and drive on up to the top and so forth. I went up there and there was Narasimha and there was... Uh, uh, <laughs> There was wonderful, uh, I call him talking boy in those days. There was talking boy and uh, an empty chair. Because I knew of the formless, I knew he was in the chair. And so I could see that he was sending telepathic messages to Montesudan, who was a student. And like when he used to, uh, he would, if any of those you remember in Puttaparthi, wherever, if any translator said the wrong thing, he would correct them. No, 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 not like this, like this. Come on, you got that wrong. So I'm sitting there, and this boy is stumbling to tell me what he's receiving these messages. He's stumbling to tell me, and Sai Baba is correcting him. No, 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 not like this. He would say, no, Swami says not like this. Like this. So finally he says, <laughs> Tiger, I'm so sorry you had to wait a year. But you see, uh, uh, Manasudan, he doesn't speak Telugu, and I transmit in Telugu. So I had to wait to teach him Telugu before I could call anybody to talk to them. <laughs> oh god it's just amazing and then he told me the whole scope what he was going to do think about it first of all who knows where the money comes from and it's good that he doesn't have it most of the time he's never he's always been broke always how do you think he saved the city of chennai when it ran out of money he hocked everything including the ashram he hawked all of it, all the lands, all the things that people given him all over India, everything, every bank account. He hawked all of it to build that and save the city of Chennai, which no one even recognizes that he did. I asked him why. He said, no, 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 I'm not in for credit. I'm here in the service. Quite amazing. Quite amazing. So he builds 29 schools now, and they're not little schools. They're big schools, and it's all in one state. What's it? Wait a minute. Why are we opening something in Andhra Pradesh? Why are we opening something in this state or Maharashtra or whatever? He opens them all in one state, Karnataka, okay, where they all speak Canada. They all speak Canada. And he brings all these children which on the surface is definitely taking kids that would be live very difficult, impoverished lifestyles out of these villages. And he's bringing them into these schools and changing every one of their lives. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. But that's not what's going on. <laughs> that's not what's going on. This is the first group under the educational system that has been created that is teaching every one of those kids about Shirdi Baba, reincarnated as Sai Baba, and reincarnated again, Prima Sai. He is creating an army 
I figured there'll be 10,000 hardcore devotees of the all three of them, including Prima, so waiting for Prima to arrive. He has an inbuilt army of devotees when he arrives. He'll have a schools, he'll have hospitals, he'll have everything. This gives him, look, Sai Baba slowly built. He didn't build it later in life and this and that. He didn't even take much credit for it. Nobody really understood all he was doing. But suddenly this wonderful new avatar at 19 will have total credibility. Schools, hospitals, and 10,000 devotees before he even arrives. That's what's going on. It's preparation for Prima Sai the last of the three. It took three to bring on the new age. That's what I'm told. First, you had Shirdi. He had the power of Shiva. And by the way, they don't come to really meet people and talk and this, all this nonsense. They come here to vibrate. Their power is so immense in the universe. They come to vibrate when the Dharma of the world is getting off the, the, the stage. And that's why they come and maybe secondarily you get to meet them or talk to them or blah, blah, blah. But that's not the main reason. They're here. That's just your good fortune. So it is an amazing time that we're going through in preparation for this third avatar. So the struggles of building another hospital down there, raising money, all that. This is the Psy story. Everybody's scrambling to do their best because they believe. Great. Great trying to make it happen, working at the hospitals, doing all those things. It's all for you. Just like the students are getting out of those villages. Yeah, there's people at the hospital being cured, but the people working there and the people putting money in it, it's all for you. That's secondary. Healing is secondary, right? Mainly he's trying to heal you. <laughs> it's not complicated. Sorry, uh, AJ, anything else? <laughs> yeah, that's, I think um, you've informed us a lot, especially during this transitional time. Your experience has been very valuable. You've answered many questions that people had, and I'm sure there are many more. But from the ATLs, we appreciate your time today. Uh, I think there's over 200 people that have joined, and we're very appreciative that they joined. Uh, obviously, there was a nugget of something for them to capture. And what we'd like to do from Atlanta is share a video at this time. Before uh, we am I getting the hook? Am I getting the hook now? Is that, is that what's happening? <laughs> it, yeah, it's called the shepherd's hook. Oh, for hours, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, the shepherd told me to say that. Um, okay. <laughs> so uh, please enjoy this video, and then we will do Arti. And um, if you're here in Atlanta, we're going to serve you prasadam. If you're not, we'll send it virtually. Thank you.